Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Now 40,000 day. It's kind of amazing. Mm-hmm. See this happen, Kaylee, as we were discussing earlier. Is there a tweet or a post from the White House on this yet? Because Donald Trump would have been playing this up big time. Yeah. And it would probably resonate in the polls. And I, I only ask that because the president has struggled to connect the dots on all things economy. And I realize they're two different things. What do you have? Biden Harris HQX account. Yes. 13 minutes ago, put out a new uh-huh. ad. About Trump in 2020 (laughs) saying the stock market would collapse if Joe Biden won, Uh noting that the Dow did just hit 40,000, the highest level ever recorded in history. So they heard you, took a swing at it. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) we've been on the air for a little bit here. I'm glad glad to always know that they're listening. Glad that you're with us as well on Bloomberg TV and radio. Uh, As we come off a couple of brutal days of testimony, day two in the Senate today, uh, wrapping up Kaylee. Uh, for the head of the FDIC. And of course, this has everything to do with a report that was submitted last week, an independent report highlighting a toxic workplace culture at the agency. And there are resounding calls on Capitol Hill uh, for Mr. Grunberg's resignation. We heard from him a bit earlier in the broadcast. Bloomberg News spoke uh, with Senator Catherine Cortez Masto of Nevada about her take on this. Here's what she told us earlier on Capitol Hill. It addresses the workplace culture and the structure when it comes to protecting these employees. And so those recommendations to me, that's the action items that they need to be taking and they need to be implementing them, every single one of them, not questioning them like the previous report under the previous chair questioned some of the recommendations that were made and challenged them. That should not happen in this case. They should be saying yes to every sec- single recommendation and implement it. To me, that is, those are part of the action items those federal employees need to see. Democratic Senator Catherine Cortez Masto on Capitol Hill earlier, and we go there now live where we're joined, I'm pleased to say, by Republican Senator Joni Ernst of Iowa, who also has introduced legislation that relates to the issues at the FDIC. Senator, thank you so much for joining us here on Bloomberg TV and radio. In the face of the reports like the one we have gotten out of the FDIC, you together with a Democratic colleague, Kirsten Gillibrand, have introduced the No Taxpayer Funded Pensions for Sex Criminals Act. Essentially, this legislation would prohibit sex criminals from collecting taxpayer funded pensions. My question, Senator, is the chairman has not been accused actually of any crimes, just perhaps having a role in, in allowing this kind of environment to continue at the FDIC. And there's been a lot of calls for his resignation. Does he deserve to collect a pension? Well, and no, he has not perpetrated any of the acts that are covered uh, by this legislation. So two separate issues. One is he is a very poor leader. He enabled this type of culture to occur at the FDIC. So I'm actually calling on him to either resign or President Joe Biden should fire him. Um, But second is the act that I have uh, drawn up with my colleague, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand of New York, that would stop taxpayer funded pensions going to those that are convicted of sexual harassment. So two separate items, but man, they come together in a nexus at the FDIC because we have seen those that exist within the FDIC uh, pushing uh, sexual harassment, unwanted sexual contact, um, illicit photos texted to females within the FDIC. So I think there is a lot to uncover here. We saw that independent report, over 340 pages of horrible, horrible frat boy type behavior happening at the FDIC. Yeah, there's been a lot of references, Senator. It's good to see you again. We haven't caught up since we were in Iowa. A lot of talk around Washington about locker room talk and locker room behavior. And it was just in in May of last year that a jury found Donald Trump liable uh, for sexual abuse. If your bill became law, would that remove his pension? 
Well, it's quite possible, but what we're focused on is those that are out there, those that have been convicted of that, and then, yes, they would have their pension stripped away. It's a behavior that has to stop. Um, so we see this in the FDIC. We see these federal employees that are really suffering. And again, I want to go back to the FDIC chairman and how he allowed this behavior to continue. Complaints were made to the FDIC, complaints that he either knew about or just simply dismissed. He himself had bad behavior, yelling at employees, uh, throwing objects, um, all very, very poor exhibits of leadership or lack thereof. But again, um, bad behavior, we need to make sure that those that are in leadership positions in the federal government know and understand that they can't take advantage of their employees if they are convic convicted, they will lose their taxpayer funded pensions. End of story. Well, Senator, if I could just go back to the fact that you just said it's quite possible if this were to become law that Donald Trump could not continue to collect a federal pension, he wouldn't be eligible for that, but still should be seen as, as qualified to collect a presidential salary back in the Oval Office come January of next year? Well, different issues, because this is an elected position. If people want him to be the president of the United States, and mm -hmm. I fully believe that he will be the president of the United States, then we will see him serving. Again, a little different issue, a little different take on it. These are people that are hired by the federal government, working in an environment where they are mm -hmm. assaulting other employees of the federal government. It is up to the federal government to protect those employees. One way we do that and we make sure that this behavior doesn't happen is by letting them know up front, if you are convicted of these crimes, you will be stripped of that pension. Hmm. Well, we're spending time with Senator Joni Ernst on Balance of Power. I'm Joe Matthew alongside Kaylee Lines in Washington. I want to ask you about a couple of other issues while we have you here, uh, Senator, including the idea of raising tariffs on China. This is something that Joe Biden chose to do this week while maintaining the Trump tariffs on China. And it's something that Bloomberg discussed uh, with Jamie Dimon, of course, from J.P. Morgan Chase. Let's listen to what he said. I think it's the right thing for America to fully and deeply engage with China, you know, competitively. You know, uh, every nation is going to do what's in their own interest for in national security. So should America. We should define that fairly and properly. If there's unfair trade, you know, negotiate that or do whatever you need to do. But the engagement is the right thing to do. Engagement is the right thing to do. Senator, how do you have both? It's really difficult, um, but we have seen President Donald Trump do the tariffs. He focused very heavily on correcting the actions for my Iowa farmers, and I felt that he was very strong on that. We see now President Joe Biden doing this, and what he is trying to do is focusing more on electric vehicles and chips and not focusing necessarily so much on my farmers in Iowa. Uh, but certainly when it comes to China, we have to be very cautious. We want to disengage engage where we can on items of national security importance, whether that's pharmaceuticals or items that go into our defense industry. I think it's extremely important, um, but we also need to make sure that we're looking out for our interests here in the United States, that we continue to develop mm -hmm. domestic manufacturing. We need to quit leaning on China. They are bad, bad trade partners. Um, and we have seen this with, I'll give an example of my Iowa farmers. China will negotiate uh, on some soybeans coming from the state of Iowa. Those soybeans are shipped by our Iowa farmers. They're heading over the Pacific Ocean. China will cancel the order, then renegotiate for a lower price on soybeans or whatever other commodity it might be. And the Iowa farmers mm -hmm. are stuck with it. This is where President Trump really stood up and did the right thing by the Iowa farmers, correcting that action with those tariffs. So um, we're going to see more of this. We're going to see a lot about this talked about before we go into the election cycle. I wish that we would see more engagement pushing back on China, whether it's uh, President Trump, whether it is President Joe Biden. 
Well, Senator, as you as you talk about the farmers in your state of Iowa, are you not concerned that if if this is pushed too far, these tariffs uh, go too far, that they could be call, fall victim to retaliation from China? Yes, this is one thing that was brought up again when President Trump was in the Oval Office. I had an Iowa farmer that actually laid it out and he said, you know, he slapped his hand on the table and he said, I know this is going to hurt for a while, but he said, I am so thankful for President Donald Trump. He's actually standing up for American farmers. He is correcting this action. So while the pain may be short term, we are going to find other outlets for corn, for soybeans, for pork, for beef, for poultry. We are going to find those other outlets. Um, America can produce, China needs it more than mm -hmm. America needs China consuming it. Senator, I'm getting the hook here, but I just have to ask you quickly in, in our last couple of seconds, are we going to get a new farm bill this year? You keep referring to my farmers or will they extend the one in place? Yes. Oh, Joe, um, we are really struggling with the farm bill this year, and it is a one and a half trillion dollar price tag in the United States Senate, but only about 14 to 15 percent of that goes to farm yeah. programs. We need to rename the bill. We're not going to pass it this year. We'll take hmm. another shot early next year. We'll have to extend the 2018 farm bill. It's a disappointment wow. Please. for sure. It's a disappointment. Please come back and talk to us about this. It's important to our yeah, listeners and viewers, just like it is to you. Senator Joni Ernst, we thank you for the time today. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Joe, it's pretty remarkable to see another great day if you're long uh, equity markets. Yeah. You've got 40,000 on the Dow. We're north mm -hmm. of 5,300 on the S&P 500. Stocks are at record highs. And yet continually, the current incumbent administration does yes. not get credit for anything really going well in the economy. It's one of his bit biggest headaches, but Absolutely. we know it's just one headache on a very long list. Well, that's true. Um, big thumbs down on the economy in just about every poll you see. Rick Davis said it earlier, Kaylee, if you had predicted 40,000 to coincide with this administration, people might have laughed at you in the throes of COVID where we were when he took office. And if this were Donald Trump, he'd probably be at the New York Stock Exchange with calling hats. this his own. Yeah, that's right. No yeah. hats today, by the way. Kind of a bummer. <laughs> I still have my 10,000 hats somewhere. <laughs> um, you're alluding to other issues, though, and Israel yeah. is one of them. Uh, we've seen this take form in a lot of different ways on the campaign trail. But what's actually happening in Israel right now as we anticipate this vote today to compel the administration to provide weaponry is less to do with what's happening in Gaza now mm -hmm. than it is what happens after the war is complete. Yeah, whenever that after yeah. ultimately is, because of course we're still not anywhere in sight of an actual completion to this current conflict between Israel and Hamas. But we know what the U.S. has been pushing for is a two-state solution. That is not something that the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu seems quite open to at this point, right. but it doesn't seem that everyone in the Israeli government has the same ideas on this, and you're starting to see that rift borne out in public. Yes, very much so. Ian Marlowe is reporting on it for us. A Bloomberg senior reporter covering diplomacy and geopolitics joins us at the table here on a post-war Gaza. Ian, is Benjamin Netanyahu becoming more isolated on this with time? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think he's stood alone uh, for some time. Uh, Secretary Blinken, who I've traveled with around the region several sure. times, has tried to corral sort of Arab partners in the region uh, to get some sort of grand bargain to bring to Israel uh, each time we go to the region. And each time we end up in Israel at the end of these trips, it seems like it just falls on deaf ears uh, again. There's uh, the, the, the day after plan is just not the priority for the Israeli government at the moment, for Netanyahu in particular. I mean, he's focused on destroying Hamas, on, on, on getting supposedly uh, you know, the hostages out as part of their deal. But anything that comes after that is, is just vague at mm -hmm. the moment. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, with the conflict dragging on as long as it has, seven months now, there's a lot of impatience to see exactly what the reality is going to be like when we get to the other side of the conflict. Well, I guess my question, Ian, is we've had a lot of conversations with people 
like yourself, with others who are experts in the Middle East and in Israel specifically, who have suggested that Benjamin Netanyahu has every incentive to keep this drawn out in order to preserve his own position of power. So I wonder if we do get to the point where we're talking about an after, whether or not he's actually going to be relevant to that equation. Because if we reach the after, is he still going to be in power? He's very relevant to the equation. The question is uh, whether he needs to be removed from power for that day after plan that the U.S. Yeah. has to actually unfold the way the U.S. Um, wants. And I think whenever U.S. officials go to Israel, they go to uh, meet with the war cabinet mm -hmm. and then they meet individually with different members of the war cabinet. And I think that's a bit of a deliberate attempt because a lot of the people in that war cabinet want to be prime minister the day uh, <laughs> Netanyahu is no longer the prime minister. And nice. so, I mean, that's a reality that he faces. Uh, and, uh, and, and Bibi also faces the fact that his coalition is very ramshackle. It's a very, it's the most right-wing government in Israeli history. There are people well to the right of Netanyahu himself who mm -hmm. say, you know, if you do, um, you know, if you agree to certain things in post-war Gaza, like a two-state solution, yeah. we are going to collapse your government. Mm -hmm. And uh, and on the other side, on the left, um, he's actually facing a little bit of a ri rising discontent there too, because in the wake of October 7th, there were all of the protests about Netanyahu and the judicial reform that he had tried to push through ended. And, and now there's kind of vague talk now of potentially having a general strike, pushing uh, the government to get a ceasefire deal and other things. So mm -hmm. uh, he's being squeezed from both ends here. And, and I think you're right. I think a lot of people I speak to say, you know, what the U.S. wants won't happen with, with Netanyahu in charge. And also this, you know, the day the war ends, Netanyahu is out. Right. And so he has every incentive to kind of string this out. So with all this noise, are, are you hearing that, that any other members of his war cabinet, Yov Gallant or otherwise, are, are back-channeling with the White House to their own benefit? I, I think any time one of them shows up in Washington, yeah. those uh, that sort of impression gets around, uh -huh. and it's it's hard to avoid. And now, um, you know, with Gallant coming out and others uh, supporting him, uh, you know, directly criticizing mm -hmm. Netanyahu and his policies, uh, it looks like to some extent that the starter pistol has wonder. been fired to wow. some extent. All right. It's great stuff. Ian Marlowe, as always, who reports on diplomacy for us here at Bloomberg. Yeah. Thank you so much. And it's so interesting, Joe, to consider that not only are there international pressures on uh, Bibi Netanyahu, including President Biden being more and more outspoken in his displeasure uh, with the Israeli government's decisions now, but facing a lot of internal pressure as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, it's really, this is an important moment. I feel like we're going to look back at this period of time in the middle of May uh, as an inflection point mm. in this process. I figure those covering the Trump trial uh, probably feel the same way, actually. Yeah. Uh, Michael Cohen's back on cross-examination. June Grasso at Bloomberg Law is reporting that the defense probably will not let go of the reins here before the weekend because they want the jury to stay focused on their case that they can probably wrap up next week. This thing is moving. Yeah, keeping in mind there is no court tomorrow. It's mm -hmm. Baron Trump's high school graduation, yeah. so there will be a day off. And then we're pretty quickly coming up on the Memorial Day holiday at the end of next week. So I do mm -hmm. wonder how logistically all of this is going to work out. But of course, they have to actually finish witness testimony and then do their closing arguments before we can get to the end of things. Right. And I just wonder what we're making of cross-examination day two, or at least what mm -hmm. Robert McWhorter is making of it. He is a criminal and constitutional law attorney. Welcome back, sir, to Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. The defense is spending a lot of time in this cross-examination trying to get Michael Cohen to admit that he has lied under oath in times past. He's been found guilty of perjury. Uh, he has spent time in prison. They're essentially trying to prove that he is willing to lie under oath. So why would the jury believe, based on this testimony, that he's not doing so again? Well, because he's in a good position to give the information which the prosecution is built up to and his statements are corroborated. Um, you know, I've said before, it doesn't matter if the jury dislikes Michael Cohen as a person. They, the issue is going to be whether they're going to believe what he says about Donald Trump and this situation. Um, that is the cross-examination of him. However, the defense began with a whole different tack, which I thought was was really ill-advised, where they started yeah. attacking him, saying, basically, you hate Donald Trump. And so the, the logical inference is, you hate their, Donald Trump, ergo, you're going to lie to do anything to get him convicted. Uh, the trouble is, Mr. Cohen has a very good response, which is, yeah, I, I, I don't like Donald Trump, or I hate Donald Trump, because Donald Trump has 
done terrible things and I have gone along with it. And now that I've had my redemption and my little epiphany, um, I've seen the light and now I'm not supporting him anywhere <clears throat> anymore. And by the way, when I was lying before, it was only on his behalf. That's why I'm here today. So overall, I don't think it works out all that terribly well for the defense. Um, hmm. I have been in many trials where the government or the state has given immunity to a certain defendant to testify against the others. And the person might be a terrible person. The jury hates him. It doesn't mean they're not going to believe what they say, given the context of the case. Robert, I wonder if if raising your voice, bringing emotion uh, as a defense attorney is a strategy. And I ask you that because Todd Blanche came in hot today. He was yelling at Michael Mm -hmm. Cohen, trying to get Cohen to yell back at him. And they had an important exchange here. Blanche highlighting this is the first time Michael Cohen has testified to having had specific telephone call or at least one call with Donald Trump to discuss paying off Stormy Daniels. Yes, I believe I was telling the truth, Cohen said. What's the defense trying to do here? Well, I don't think the defense is doing a particularly good job of winning the case with the jury. I think what the defense is trying to do there is make their client happy. And I think what they're doing is fulfilling their client's bigger goals. And I'm going to take kind of a unique tack on this that I haven't heard a lot of people talk about. I don't think for Donald Trump what happens in the courtroom is all that terribly important. What's important for him is what's happening outside of the courtroom. And his ability to spin what's going on in the courtroom as his political strategy dictates. Um, Look, he gets up after, after every court day. And he complains that I should be campaigning. Well, if he's out campaigning, he's out talking to maybe a couple hundred people at a rally, maybe a few thousand, right? But he gets to talk Mm -hmm. to five million or more people every time he walks out of that courthouse and talks of free media coverage. And his themes are the same. So, for instance, with Michael Cohen, um, he can walk up and he always talks about, you know, Trump, Trump derangement syndrome. Well, if you think about that, what that is saying is those people are crazy because they dislike me, ignoring the fact that those people dislike him because of what he does. So if your cross-examination of Michael Cohen is, oh, you just hate Donald Trump, Donald Trump comes out and plays the same theme. And he ties it into this great conspiracy against him, and he's their savior of all the people out in TV land. That's what's important to Donald Trump. And his lawyers are accommodating this in their performance in the courtroom. And I don't think it plays well at all with the jury, but Trump has already decided it doesn't matter if he loses that trial, because by the time he gets sentenced, by the time appeals happen, he thinks he's going to be president of the United States. He's never going to serve a day in jail. I think that's Trump's overall Mm. goal, which is why he closes his eyes during most of the trial, whether he's sleeping or not. Okay, so that's the considerations for the case involving the former president. I also want to ask you about something involving the current president, Robert, as we have had Joe Biden today exerting executive privilege over recordings from the investigation into his handling of classified documents, his conversation with special counsel Robert Herr. Merrick Garland, the the attorney general, is about to be held in contempt of Congress over this, and we have seen executive privilege uh, now Uh, basically used to make sure that this does not, in fact, get in the hands of the lawmakers who are asking for it. We have heard a great deal of upset on the Republican side about this, including from the House Speaker, Mike Johnson. Just take a listen to what he had to say earlier. The president is using all of his power to suppress their release. And, And rather than defend our closest ally at war, President Biden is using his authority to defend himself politically. So arguably, Robert, he is using authority that is his to use should he so choose. But is he setting a dangerous precedent here by not releasing these tapes? No, not really. Um, Look, first of all, executive privilege belongs to the office. It doesn't belong to Joe Biden. Um, So when all of Donald Trump and his kind of entourage and his minions say, oh, I, I have executive privilege, they're wrong because only the current holder of the office has that privilege. The next person who holds that office could decide to release whatever they want because the privilege goes with the office. Now, I think there's a good argument to be made. Liz says, look, you already got the transcripts of what happened here. Mm -hmm. And you got a gratuitous statement from Robert Herr about, 
oh, he's, you know, he's old, he doesn't remember, which had nothing to do with his findings. Actually, the, her findings were quite beneficial to President Biden. Um, it draw the distinction between the two cases, President Biden's case and Donald Trump's case, in terms of retaining of document, documents. They're very, very different. But then he put in that gratuitous statement, which was simply to give fodder uh, for this argument and the narrative that Joe Biden is not competent, too old, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, utterly uh, useless in terms of what the report was supposed to do in the, the prosecutorial evaluation. So, you know, that's kind of what the privilege is. This pre president does have it. I su assume he mm -hmm. decides that there's no value uh, for the American people to have this come out, certainly not a value to him. And of course, Speaker Johnson then tries to tie that into something to do with Israel at the end, I assume, by his statement that, you know, President yes, Biden right. should be more worried about our allies versus this. That's a total non second. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with either one. But that's kind of the political game I see going on there. He straddles criminal and constitutional law, which is why he's an important voice for us here. Robert McWhorter, we thank you for being with us, sir. As always, on Balance of Power, I'm Joe Matthew alongside Kaylee Lines in Washington. The word on this, by the way, transcript versus tape from mm. Jim Jordan, of course, Judiciary Chair. Changes in voice inflection and emphasis are what you need that you do not get in a transcript. But he probably will never hear that tape. Yeah. I guess that's why people watch us on TV and listen to us on radio. Don't just read us. That's right? true. Actually, yeah. I hear this is a good listen still, <laughs> even though we're on camera. We'll have more from our panel coming up next. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. That decisions out of Washington often do have the ability to impact financial markets, certain stocks, certain yep. ETFs, like, say, rescheduling marijuana. Mm -hmm. I noticed today MJ mm -hmm. up nearly 6% after just moments ago, President Biden takes to X. Too many lives have been upended by our failed approach to marijuana. So today, the Justice Department is taking the next step to reclassify marijuana from a Schedule 1 to a Schedule 3 drug yep. under federal law. It's happening, Joe. This is a big deal. It is actually happening. We've been mm -hmm. talking about this for a very long time. And for the president to do a direct-to-video, direct-to-camera statement on this says a lot about uh, the demographics he's trying to appeal to yeah. here, i.e. young people. Um, MSOS is the other ETF that's specific to U.S. cannabis companies impacted by this. That's up over 8% right now. As our buddy Nathan Dean likes to say at Bloomberg Intelligence, the pot stocks have hot sauce on them, and they go <laughs> crazy in both directions. So let's see if this holds. Yeah, I guess we will. But to your point, it's not a coincidence in all likelihood, Joe, that this yeah. is happening in no. the middle of an election cycle. That's right. Um, not to mention the fact that we're actually waiting for news on safe banking. Mm -hmm. uh, there has been uh, an effort to get this done, largely by Democrats, but some Republicans are on board as well. Let's assemble our panel to get their take on this and all the other stories that we're covering today. Rick Davis and Jeannie Shanzano join us, Bloomberg Politics contributors here on Bloomberg TV and radio. We didn't see this one coming, guys, but here we are. Uh, Jeannie, it's just another. You can talk about forgiving student loan debt or some of the other ways that Joe Biden has tried to appeal to younger voters. In this case, does it work? And with whom? You know, I don't see this as changing the trajectory of the election. Um, you know, marijuana legalization is something, to your point, young people support in overwhelming numbers, and they long have. Um, that mm -hmm. said, it doesn't usually rank at the top of their list. Still at the top of their list is the economy. So I think this yeah. is important, as you guys were just talking about. But this has to do with promises kept, doesn't it, Jeannie? Promises kept on the campaign in 2020. It does have to do with that. I'm still not convinced it will change support. I think much more important is going to be his taking on economic issues that matter to these young people, and they are enormous. So I think this is a positive step. And you're right, it does meet a campaign promise, although I just really still don't see it as going all the way to change votes, if you will. Well, fair enough. Obviously, young people are one demographic in which President Biden is seeing turn away from him. Rick, another is black voters, and he is 
arguably trying to take some corrective measure in that regard as well this week as he today is meeting with uh, family members uh, in the Brown versus Board of Education case. He'll be uh, doing an, uh, another uh, event here in D.C. at the African American History Museum. Later this week, he's giving the commencement address at Morehouse this weekend. Does any of that go far enough? How much work does he still have to do? Yeah, look, I think that uh, we heard from Dr. King this week that uh, you got to walk the walk. You got to be there all the time. It's not just an election year issue. And I think she's exactly right. <clears throat> I think I can't imagine anybody walking the walk more than Joe Biden has. Uh, but again, I mean, I have to echo what Jeannie just said. I mean, this is all about the economic uh, situation that young, black, especially urban males find themselves in. Uh, and it's not good. And and they're blaming the Biden administration, right? They didn't have as many pressures on them uh, economically during the Trump administration. They had other cultural uh, uh, challenges that, uh, that exacerbated themselves in the Trump administration. But for whatever reason, those seem to have, you know, fallen by the wayside. And, and now it's a battle with, you know, with Joe Biden over the economic well-being of, of the black community. Uh, and these are core Democratic voters. So if, if he loses them, uh, he's really got a problem with 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 his base. Uh, it's not just swing voters anymore. And and I would say I, I, I don't think the cannabis issue plays out really very much. I consider it a feel good issue. Right. In other words, it mm -hmm. fulfills a promise. You know, uh, it does what you mm -hmm. need to do to sort of get over it. But there are very few young voters, uh, very few urban voters, very few voters who, you know, are in the Biden coalition who are going to vote for Donald Trump unless he, you know, uh, uh, legalizes pot, right? That's just that's just right. not a voter that exists in any poll I've ever seen. So the challenge mm -hmm. with black voters this week, he's showing some leg on it, but uh, the question is, can he meet that 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 challenge by being able to at least articulate uh, a better economic opportunity for for that community in the next four years? And again, where's the plan for the next four years economically? All we hear about is getting past tomorrow. Well, speaking of a feel-good issue, how about a presidential pardon? Not for those convicted of smoking marijuana, but for Donald Trump. Mitt Romney, of course, the former standard bearer of the Republican Party, thinks that's exactly what Joe Biden should do and should have already done. He talked about it in an interview. Let's listen. I think President Biden made an enormous error. He should have fought like crazy to keep this prosecution from going forward. Uh, it was a win-win for Donald Trump. Had I been President Biden, uh, when the Justice Department brought out indictments, I would have immediately uh, uh, pardoned him. I'd have pardoned President Trump. That was in an interview with MSNBC. Uh, Jeannie, what do you think about this? I'm pretty sure Joe Biden was not about to pardon Donald Trump. What would the reaction be? You know, I, I'm baffled by this for several reasons, but let's just start with one, which is the fact that while a pardon can reach to the federal cases, those federal cases are not going forward, apparently, in all likelihood, before the campaign. The, I mean, for the election, rather. The only one that has is the state case. And, of course, Joe Biden has no say in what the state of New York does or the state of Georgia. So I, I'm not quite clear on, on what Romney's getting there. What I do agree with him on is the fact that Democrats have to fight Donald Trump at the ballot box and not rely on the courts. That said, there's no evidence that Joe Biden has been part and parcel of this prosecution um, of Donald Trump. So I don't know how he stops it other than getting involved, which no president should do. But one of the other things that Senator Romney said, Rick, is that this is a win-win for Donald Trump. Does he not have a point there that so far the prosecution of the former president has only served him in his re uh, campaign for the White House? Yeah, hindsight is 2020 vision. Uh, I think you can now look at and say advantage Trump when it comes to at least the current status of his legal problems. Uh, if he doesn't win an election and he gets convicted and he winds up serving time in prison, I don't think anybody's going to say that. But that's not where we are. Fair today. enough. And I would say very clearly that um, uh, uh, Senator Romney isn't claiming that Joe Biden has anything to do with these prosecutions. If anything, I think he would say that uh, this proves that no one is a, above the law. But I think what he's trying to get to is a return to civility, a return to a dialogue that is not so uh, detrimental to our national interests. And, 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 and that, that only gets achieved by people making sacrifices. And, and in this case, the sacrifice would have been the president's 
to to basically reach out with the power that he has to grant a pardon to somebody who highly likely at the time was going to be the nominee of the party. And and I think there's something about national unity and rising above it and serving causes greater than your own political self-interest that would have inured greatly to Biden's advantage. But that's not where we are. And and that gives the cudgel to Donald Trump to then use his prosecution against Joe Biden. And so that that's just fair. Right. I mean, it's wow. his Justice Department that has indicted him while he's a presidential candidate. And, you know, arguably. He's done things that are wrong that have been inured to this. He is a court of law going to decide whether he's guilty of these things or not. But does that really advance the national dialogue the way we would normally want to see it? I doubt if any voter would say, yeah, that's Republican or Democrat alike, that this is this is a good place where we found ourselves. It's really interesting, Jeannie. What's your thought on that to come back around? Could Joe Biden actually turn a few independent voters his way? Just the optics of doing what appears to be best for the nation. Um, I don't think it would change voters' minds. I think he would probably risk losing as many as he may gain in the middle. And I think, you know, what Rick what Rick is talking about, um, I think, is an important point. Um, I don't think it would help Joe Biden, in other words, politically at this point in terms of the election. But for the better interest of the public good, it may be something worth considering. But again, this prosecution we're seeing the hush money is a state court he has got no reach there he could take action potentially on the federal case is very unusual to do before the man has even been convicted and nothing would happen before the election so you know i see uh, senator romney's point but i think it's a little bit too late to think about something along those lines All right, Jeannie Shanzano and Rick Davis, our signature political panel, thank you so much. And it is an important thing to consider here, Joe, while Donald Trump wouldn't be able to pardon himself if he wins re-election in Mm -hmm. the state cases, just the federal ones. We don't even know if the federal cases will ever move forward. That's true. Delayed Uh, indefinitely at this point. We have to remind ourselves that we're still waiting for a very important ruling Mm -hmm. from the Supreme Court on presidential immunity. That may or may not lead to a Jack Smith January 6th trial. That would be a potential game changer. Yeah, well, we'll know, we think, by June 30th when it's the end of the term. But they could always kick it back down to a lower court and just elongate this process any further. We'll, of course, keep you updated when we get news. We just don't have it quite yet. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. As we turn our attention to what's happening in lower Manhattan once again, cross-examination today from Michael Cohen, but it's more the guests of the former president Uh, the latest batch of surrogates who are making news, because frankly, as we talked about with June Grasso, we've heard a lot of this already uh, from Michael Cohen. Remember, the Speaker of the House went to the court a couple of days ago. We've seen a number of folks who want to be Vice President, Byron Donalds. We saw Governor Doug Burgum up there, Vivek Ramaswamy, the litigator. Today, it's the Freedom Caucus. They're not wearing matching suits, but they are there with matching messages. Matt Gates. Bob Good, Andy Gibbs, Lauren Boebert, all photographed in the courtroom there to, I guess, pitch in here uh, on the effort. Lisa Camuso Miller is seeing this photograph, if you're with us on YouTube, for the first time right now. There they are in court as Donald Trump spoke earlier with reporters. There's your lineup. Of course, Republican strategist, former comms director at the RNC. Great to see you. Welcome back. Are you going to court soon? No, thank you. (laughs) Okay. This has become a strange uh, field trip that is apparently required if you you want to be in the fold. What what do you do if you can't be on the campaign trail? You have to bring people to you, right? So it's smart? I mean, we're in uncharted territory, Uh right? I mean, this is like something we've never had to see before. But ordinarily, when you're on the campaign trail, you're sitting down (laughs) and you're bringing people behind you. You're standing at the podium and they are standing as your supporters. Mm -hmm. So... I suppose that this is the new normal, right? We are going to see people make the pilgrimage to Lower Manhattan to yeah. stand behind the former president. As long as this thing's going. That's for as long as this goes. This is like the new Codell. You just it's, go on up to New York and... But it's not serious, right? So at some point, I think, though, there's a, there, the worm turns, right? And if mm. you are a member of Congress and you are supposed to be demonstrating action and change for the elected 
as an elected person for the constituencies, mm -hmm. does this does this come back at you? Do right. people say, why are you not home in the district? Why are you not in the Capitol doing the work that you need to be doing? So to me, this is something I think they have to be very, very careful about because, right, election season is on and they want to see Congress get work done. The Absolutely. voters do anyway, That's right? That's the idea. Well, yeah. let me ask you about that. A couple of things here. Uh, before we get to actual business, I mentioned the Speaker of the House was there at the courthouse. And as yeah. someone who worked for a former Republican speaker, I can't imagine what went through your mind. That's not just a lawmaker. This is one of the highest ranking elected officials in the United States of America. And Democrats are pretty upset that he went there and have made clear in some cases that they will not be there to support him if there's another motion to vacate. I know he needs Donald Trump, but it sure seems like he needs Democrats, too. What did he just do to himself? He does, but also, too, Donald Trump has been a really big supporter for mm -hmm. this speaker. So that's right? clearly he's the done, more important He's ally. done everything he can to keep the, the speaker at least sort of neutral in this fight with the Marjorie Taylor Greens of the world and mm -hmm. all of these other people. The president, the former president, has said he would prefer that that not happen. Mm -hmm. And so it, it all depends on what the vote is, right? So Democrats can say whatever they're going to say, but if we come down to a vote that's about supporting our allies overseas or a vote that's about the economy, Democrats are going to have to work with this Congress be or this Republican conference because the margins are so, so narrow otherwise. Yeah. Wow. Um, he did manage to get the FAA reauthorization done, not to mention all the rest. We saw Ukraine funding pass Israel, a lot of things that we were told we're never going to see the light of day. So he's got a little bit of momentum here, but now we're told that that's it. It's the 16th of May. Are we done for the rest of this Congress? Well, it sure feels like, I mean, I, I heard you earlier say yeah. that like this is a messaging game from this point on. That's precisely what happens in an election year. And so it does really feel that way. But if you're the speaker and you are looking back at your track record, he's mm -hmm. got to be feeling pretty confident about the fact that he got a lot done. The expectations for this this member was so low. True. And the fact that he got these things completed and got them done, FAA reauthorization, mm -hmm. all of that is real accomplishment that ordinarily no one would have thought would have gotten done. Right. And now Republicans get to ride on that success and use it as they're doing their messaging and moving forward into election day. So bring us inside the speaker's office at a moment like this. Mike Johnson, uh, who we're seeing there at the court the other day uh, on YouTube, um, back in town, you, you bring your people in in the speaker's office. What's the conversation when it's like, okay, well, it's strategy mapping. We're going to get this Israel thing tonight. What do we do next, Mr. Speaker? How do we deploy the troops? Knowing, as you just said, there's no more policy being made the rest of this year. There's not, but there, you have to think about what are the messages, right? So they're looking really smartly at what mm -hmm. are the topics that people care about, right? Mm -hmm. They care about the economy. They want to see action. They want to actually, more than anything, they want to see change. They're not happy with the way this administration is handling things right now. So they're right. going to do everything they can to demonstrate that reelecting or electing a larger majority in the Republican conference actually would be better and more productive for the American people. And so sure. that, to me, is the kind of messaging that they're going to be considering and working on mm -hmm. from now until long after. Uh, Memorial Day and into Election Day. So you think about how to seize the moment then, and you've been through this time of year. We're going into the campaign cycle, right? Members, you want the members to go away. Absolutely. Don't be in Washington. Go run for re-election and raise money mm -hmm. for all of us. Right. Uh, are we going to see more runs to the border? Where, where are the photo ops and, and the events that carry us through the summer? Well, smartly, they're probably all looking at their own specific districts. So yes, yeah. in those border states, they're going to talk about the border. In the mm -hmm. states where they are really concerned about uh, the support of the uh, the military, that they're going to be talking about that. They're going to look very specifically at what it is their own specific issues are that they can talk directly about. And you and I both know this. I mean, it, it, I didn't make the I didn't make up the mm -hmm. phrase. I mean, it's been around for as long as you and I've been walking on the earth. But it's about the economy more than mm -hmm. anything else. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to talk about what it is this this administration has done to not make people feel better about their own home budgets and their own, uh, you know, sort of uh, their own personal economy. Sure. They're also going to be talking about how it is that electing Republicans means success for everyone outside of the Beltway. This is, of course, all against the backdrop of a presidential race, uh, which is something that you and I talk about a lot. And yesterday, the big news was debates. There's a debate about the debates now on this day yeah. after as to who was baited, who got, you know, served. Does it help both of these candidates to stand in front of the American people and have an old fashioned debate? Because a lot of people thought we were beyond that. I think it hurts both of them. It hurts both of them. I think. I mean, neither one of them, neither one of them is very good in a debate. Donald Trump <laughs> looks petulant. And Joe Biden is, at this point, he also, the two of them are not great debaters, at least in my sort of personal public affairs point Shut of view. Shut up, man, kind of isn't way. the kind of Shut eloquence you're looking for? Shut up, man, is not for? good. Okay. And also, like, not 
who watches the debates, right? People like you and me, right? So I feel like it is also happening in an echo chamber. Yeah. We're all sort of like... More than ever now. It's on cable news. I know. And we're all paying attention to whether or not one over the other does better here mm-hmm. in the debates. I think that there will be gaffes. I think that it provides each one of them an opportunity to attack the other. So more than anything else, yes, this is the way the process has always worked. But the American people are going to be tuning into YouTube and Netflix and all the other places they yeah. can because they're really not interested in what these two guys have to say, especially when they're debating one another. I've got to be honest with you, it would not have surprised me if they had announced a, net, a live Netflix debate. Wouldn't that be the modern thing to do? It would be the modern thing to do, but we're looking at two guys that are like well, not never, really yeah, modern. They don't right? watch Netflix, which is part of the problem. <laughs> so you're, you're, you're prepping Joe Biden. I'm sorry, but you got the job. Uh-huh. How do you operate by the rules if the other guy's not going to? I'd like to see more of that Joe Biden that delivered the State of the so Union. So you tell him right? to go I mean, in there, rip go it. Go and play, ready. play by his What rules. does he have to lose, Joe? He has well, nothing to lose. Well, I don't know. You, you just reminded us of the stakes here. He does. He, I mean, he does. The president himself does stumble. He's famous for all of the gaffes that he makes. Mm-hmm. But also, too, the people that love and are going to support Joe Biden are with Joe Biden. They'd prefer to see him stand up to Donald Trump and call him on the inaccuracies and the falsehoods that he advances oh. when he's uh, in the debate. Right. But can that happen in real time? I'm not so sure. And so that's what I'd be looking for. I'd be looking for opportunities. I'd be looking for one-liners. I'd be looking for the kinds of things for the spe- for the for, excuse me for the president yeah. to use as ways to go back at Donald Trump without attacking him, but also calling him for some of the inaccuracies and the falsehoods that he does advance when he's on the debate stage. You support the idea of cutting mics when people go over time? Yes, I do. Some, because do. I think people like you and me who are consuming these debates want to hear <laughs> the issues and don't want to hear the we, back and forth. We, we deserve mercy. But uh, isn't that a precedent, though? I keep bringing this up and people, I, it's, it, it, I don't, nothing matters anymore. But to be cutting off the microphone of the president of the United States, that's a new precedent. That would be really difficult. Yeah. And if they didn't do it on the debate stage with the candidates, Joe, it's super unlikely they're, that they're going to do it you with think two, so? I mean, one former president yes, and one right. sitting president. It is very unlikely. And so it's going to be the kind of thing that's going to be unpalatable. People aren't going to want to watch it. Wow. Yeah, you and I will. We, that's the yep, best part. We're paid to smart do it. to go early. That's a win for Biden. Get him up in June. I think it's smart to go. It says early. a lot about his polls right it now. It really, it really does. And I also think too that it's smart for him to take on Donald Trump, especially now when he's in the courtroom. So yeah. Joe Biden can be per- perceived as someone who is leading and standing behind the podium at the White House, and right. and, and he is a, an elected that is uh, at least sort of perceived to be uh, not in the courtroom defending himself against bad decisions that the former president potentially possibly may have made. Yes, wow. uh, so the optics are good that they, he can then go back to the podium at the White House, stand yep. behind the bully pulpit and say smart things. Well, Donald Trump is in the courtroom uh, talking about his debate performance while he's also talking about his private performances. <laughs> I heard something <laughs> about that. Thanks for listening to the Balance of Power podcast. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already at Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can find us live every weekday from Washington, D.C. at noontime Eastern at Bloomberg.com.